Open our minds, O Lord, that we may know you. Open our hearts that we may love you. Open our lives that we may take your love to the world. Amen. Amen. So I'm not much for shopping these days, but I do like to poke around in secondhand stores when I'm in need of a piece of clothing or a flower pot or a small furniture item. It can be frustrating to find exactly what you need, but if you go in with open eyes and mind, there are treasures to be had. My two winter coats are an example of this. A gray tweed that I found at a Goodwill store in Columbus, and a purple car coat that I snagged at the St. Paul's yard sale back in 2018. So if you donated that, co that purple coat, thank you. It's great. It didn't matter to me that they weren't new or someone else's cast-offs. They were in good condition and they were new to me. And of course, the price was right. I wonder often about our culture's obsession with all that is brand new, hot off the press or the assembly line. In contrast to that, there's this parallel obsession with rehabbing, making old houses or furniture or even people fresh and new again. There's something so hopeful, miraculous even, about taking something that is tired and beat up and broken and restoring it to a new beauty and purpose. I never tire of those stories. They are like resurrection to me. I have been thinking about this because our readings for today are in a certain sense about making things new. Jesus gives his disciples a new commandment. And in Revelation, we see the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. And the one seated on the throne saying, see, I am making all things new. And in Acts, Peter describes his call to a new way of thinking about and relating to Gentiles. What does all this business of newness really mean? In Peter's case, his identity as an apostle of Jesus meant that he was being called into new territory. He was confronted with the question of whether Jesus was the Messiah of the Jewish people only or also of the Gentiles, and whether he, Peter, would participate in that new mission. Now we should beware of seeing this newness as somehow dismissing or superseding Jewish tradition of maintaining distinctness or of labeling Judaism as xenophobic. That's just not the case. The newness into which Peter is invited is an expansion, not a rejection or a replacement of his particular identity as a man of Israel. It's the same with the New Testament. It does not reject or replace the Hebrew Bible but invites us Gentiles into relationship with the God of Moses and Miriam, the God of Jesus and Mary. And when Jesus tells his disciples, I give you a new commandment, in a way there's nothing new about it. Torah has made it clear that loving God and loving neighbor are the foundations of religious life. So perhaps it is our understanding of new that needs to be explored. My friend and colleague, the Reverend Kit Lonergan, who serves at Trinity Copley Square, wrote this recently. I wonder, though, whether we limited the idea of new to unused rather than restored, revealed, uncovered. Kit was reflecting on the experience of her mother cleaning their apartment every Friday, giving fresh, 
new life to objects and surfaces that had gotten grimy from just the daily practices of living. Every week, Kit writes, the apartment was made truly new. And I can't help but reflect on whether this is how God makes all things new. Not by erasing what has been, but by restoring it to its original beauty and goodness. At the end of the book of Revelation, in the vision we heard just a while ago, John sees a new heaven and a new earth and the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God. Now, our unfamiliarity with the book of Revelation and the dominance of fundamentalist views of this book make us think this is about annihilation and violent destruction. But I think there's another way to read it. For these last two chapters of Revelation make it clear that God's intention is to heal and restore creation and all that is in it, in both heaven and earth. Making all things new is the result of God making a home with us, dwelling with us, wiping our tears and erasing our sorrow and our pain. Notice that the one seated on the throne says, I am making all things new, not I am making all new things. I got that from the New Interpreter's Bible. It wasn't my idea, <laughs> but it's cool. It seems to me that it is the presence of God and the indwelling of God in Jesus and Jesus in us that is the key to making all things new. The new commandment to love one another is only possible because Jesus sets an example of servant love in washing the disciples' feet. And he sends the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, to fill the disciples with love and with power to serve. What is new is our capacity to live into what God has created us to be. There is so much more beauty in something that has been restored than in something that is brand new and never been used. Restoration reveals the beauty of ancient use, of tarnish and dirt and breakage born of honest human life and labor. Restoration digs down to the past and releases the ancient beauty residing beneath the layers. I have a priest friend who is also a woodworker. We were sponsored for ordination by the same Anglo-Catholic parish back in Columbus. As he was refinishing an old prayer desk that had been in the sanctuary for decades, sanding down all the layers of varnish, he suddenly realized he could smell incense. All the years of worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness were revealed and released in that moment of restoration. I think that is in some way how God restores us, restores the world, makes all things new. Everything we have been and all that we continue to be is not destroyed, but is restored, released, fills the world with its fragrance. As Thomas Aquinas famously wrote, divine grace does not destroy nature, but perfects it. Restoration also reveals the beauty and care of the one who is doing the restoring. Making things new is an act of diligence and patience 
and of love. When Jesus says that the Son of Man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him, it is the glory of lovingly restoring creation that is being revealed. A glory that looks like kneeling down and washing feet. A glory revealed in the painstaking hard work of making a beautiful but damaged world new. Made new, restored, as my friend Kit writes, with love, attention, and elbow grease. I think God has definitely been applying some elbow grease on me these days. There's been a lot of scrubbing and getting the dirt out of the crevices. But I pray that my own restoration is making me more able to join in God's work of making all things new. I think I can see it happening in all of us. Can you?